So since we have picked LZ as the um, component of the angular momentum that we know, we're looking for simultaneous eigenvalues of L squared and LZ. So we want um, a function when I operate LZ on that function, I get some eigenvalue out, let's call it B times psi. And when I operate L squared on psi, I get another eigenfunction out times psi back again. But they're both eigen, um, the, the functions are eigenfunctions simultaneously of both of those operators. So this, both of these have to be true at the same time for each function. Since the LZ operator only depends on the phi direction, this is a one variable ordinary differential equation that we need to solve. So that one's relatively easy to solve. But the L squared operator depends on both phi and theta. So if we can find these solutions, we can plug them in to our um, eigenvalue problem for L squared and find the solution for theta. When we're able to do this, we say that this problem is separable. So in other words, if I think about my wave function, it has to be a function of both theta and phi, but I can write this as um, a function in um, a function in theta times a function in phi. So we'll say m of phi. So if if it's true that my function is just um, two different functions multiplied together, then I can separate the problem into two different eigenvalue problems and solve each of them separately. So let's take the easy one first. So LZ operating on psi equals um, the eigenvalue for that times psi back again. So LZ is just minus I H bar, take the derivative of psi with respect to phi, and that's gonna equal some constant times psi back again. And you'll recognize that we've already solved this problem because these are exactly the, the um, solutions that solve the uh, free particle. Remember that the free particle had momentum. If we took the momentum operator and operated on psi for a free particle, we got um, the momentum back again, some, some eigenvalue times psi, and our wave functions were e to the um, i, k, x, and e to the minus i, k, x. So we've really already solved this problem because the momentum operator uh, the, for the free particle is minus i h bar take the first derivative, and that's exactly what we have here. So keeping in mind that we've already solved this problem, we know what these wave functions should look like. So now we're, we, our variable is phi, not, um, not x. And so we can write this as um, psi at phi is equal to e to the minus i k phi or e to the i k phi. So plus or minus i k phi where k in this case is just equal to um, b over h bar. Unlike with linear motion, I have to be a little bit careful here because my particle is going in a circle. And so if it starts out at some angle phi from, from the um, x-axis, so if I start out here at some angle phi um, and I at go all the way around 2 pi. 2 pi takes me right back to where I started. And so the point phi and phi plus 2 pi are the same point. And if those are the same point, then 
my wave function has to be the same at phi as it is at phi plus 2 pi. Because if I have different values at that point, then I would have a different probability. I have two different probabilities at that same point in space, and that can't be true if I'm going to interpret my wave function squared as being the probability of finding the particle at a given point in space. So I have to make sure that psi at phi is equal to psi at phi plus 2 pi. So let's take psi at phi, so e to the plus or minus i k phi, has to be equal to e to the plus or minus i k phi plus 2 pi. So I can write um, this as i k phi equals e to the plus or minus i k phi times e to the plus or minus i k times 2 pi. So um, all I've done is said that e to the a plus b is equal to e to the a times e to the b. So now I can see that I have this and this are exactly the same factor on both sides of the equation. So I can write that 1 is equal to e to the plus or minus i k 2 pi. So we have to have values of k such that e to the i k 2 pi is equal to 1. So remember that I can write e to the i k times 2 pi as cosine of k 2 pi plus or minus i sine of k times 2 pi. So that has to equal 1. Well, 1 is not imaginary, so it can't be the sine function. So I can get rid of this. And so I need all the values of cosine of 2 pi k that equal 1. And so k has to be an, um, an integer because cosine is only equal to 1 at 0, 2 pi, 4 pi, 6 pi, etc. So we know that k has to be an integer and it can be 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. But notice that it could also be minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, because if I have the cosine of minus 2 pi, it's the same as the cosine of 2 pi. So this means that because my function has to be single valued, I can write that my wave function for the LZ operator is psi at phi is equal to e to the i absolute value of m times phi, where the absolute value of m can equal 0, 1, 2, etc. So that's my final solution for the phi direction. So my full solution is also going to include a solution for the theta direction. Um, and notice that when I operate L squared on psi, which has to be a function of theta and phi, I need to get some eigenvalue times that eigenfunction back again. But I can write psi theta at, at theta and phi equal to some function of theta, plus now what I know my function is in terms of phi. So I have um, part of my solution already done, and um, I just need to figure out what the theta part of this is. So I have to solve this differential equation, and this is um, a complicated second order ordinary differential equation, um, but what we find is that the functions that satisfy this have two quantum numbers. So we got a quantum number m, m from solving the phi equation. And we're going to get another quantum number from solving the um, equation in the theta direction. And we're going to use L for that quantum number. So our um, 
our final uh, eigenfunctions depend on two quantum numbers, L and M, and um, this, these Y functions are functions of both L and M, and these are called the associated Legendre polynomials. And the full angular solution has these associated Legendre polynomials multiplied by the exponential for the phi direction. So this is very similar in some ways to our solutions for the simple harmonic oscillator where we had a polynomial times an exponential function. So again, we're going to have a polynomial times an exponential function. So um, the final solutions that depend on both theta and phi have some normalization constant that depends on which state we're in, whether we have what M and what L quantum number we have. These um, associated Legendre polynomials, which also depend on which L and M we have, and then it's all multiplied by our function for phi. The Legendre polynomials can be looked up in a table. This whole thing put together are called spherical harmonics. So these spherical harmonics are functions that we can look up that solve this equation. Notice that we have two quantum numbers because we have two directions. And both directions have boundary conditions, and so we had to throw out wave functions that didn't fit those boundary conditions, and that left us with only certain solutions that solve the equation, and therefore the solutions are quantized, because only the solutions that are acceptable physical um, wave functions will solve the problem, and when we throw out wave functions, we get only particular wave functions, only particular energies that will work. So last but not least, let's talk about our eigenvalues. So when I operate LZ on my wave functions for the angular moment, for the angular motion, I get M times H bar times that function back again. And so m times h bar is my LZ component of the angular momentum. When I operate L squared on these wave functions, these spherical harmonics, I get L times L plus 1 h bar squared times that function back again. And so my length of my vector, so my length squared, is equal to L times L plus 1 times h bar squared. That's the quantum number, so that is my magnitude squared of my angular momentum. So the magnitude of the angular momentum itself is equal to the square root of L times L plus 1 times h bar. So the values of the um, quantum numbers that are that give me acceptable solutions are that L can go from 0, 1, 2, etc. And M can be any number from minus L up to 0 up to plus L. So M is restricted based on the values of L, and L can be any integer from 0 on up. So notice that if I have an L of zero, there's only one possibility for m. It has to equal zero. So this is a non-degenerate state. It has only one particular state of the system that has a total angular momentum equal to zero. So notice that the total angular momentum here is equal to zero. So the energy of that system is related to the angular momentum. But if L is equal to 1, then M can be minus 1, 0, and 1. So now we have a non, we have a degenerate level where 
the energy of each one of these states of the system is equal to square root of 1 times 1 plus 1 times h bar or square root of 2 times h bar. So the energy of each of these systems is exactly the same. It's related to the angular momentum of the square root of 2 h bar, but they are um, eigenfunctions because they have a different shadow on the z-axis. So if we think about our vector model here, we could draw this where we have a z-axis here. We have one vector that has a length of square root of 2 h-bar that has a zero axis, a zero shadow on the z-axis. So it is perpendicular to the z-axis. has no shadow on the z-axis. And then if I just draw myself a little circle with that radius, I have um, a vector that has a shadow on the z-axis of m times h-bar, so 1 times h-bar is h-bar, or minus 1 times h-bar. So I have one that has a shadow on the z-axis of minus h-bar. And so I have a vector like this, and I have a vector like this. And so I have three different states of the system, three different eigenstates, three different eigenfunctions that all have the same energy because the energy is directly proportional to the angular momentum, but they point in different directions and so they are different states. So this is triply degenerate. So this is the first system that we've looked at where we see this degeneracy of states.